Let's have a look at the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. You've probably heard a little bit about the Uncertainty Principle. It has something to do with it being impossible to know exactly where, say, an electron is at the same time as you know its exact momentum. It's impossible to know both of those precisely at the same time. This really comes down to the idea of the wave-particle duality. Say an electron has both a particle nature and a wave nature. And if we know a lot about the wave nature, well, waves are really spread out. If we know a lot about the wave nature, we don't know much about the localization of the particle. Whereas, of course, particles are very localized. If we know a lot about the particle nature, then we don't know much about the wave nature. And that leads to this Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And here's kind of a common sense version of it. Now, if we want to see an electron, or to locate an electron, well, to see something, you've got to hit it with a photon. But, of course, photons themselves have some momentum. And so they're going to knock the particle that you're trying to look at and change its momentum. So there, bec there becomes an uncertainty to, to the momentum of that electron. If you wanted to kind of get around that, what you'd do is say, well, let's use some really low-energy photons. But the problem with that is, sure, the low-energy photons, they have less momentum. So they're not going to change your momentum very much at all. So you're going to know your momentum a lot more precisely. The problem is, if, if you have low energy photons, that means you've got a long wavelength. And the way that we can kind of locate things with waves is to tell that they're within one wavelength. They're between two crests, in essence. And therefore, you're not going to be able to locate the electron very precisely if you use low energy photons. So position and momentum, they're known as a conjugate pair. The more you know about one, the less you'll know about the other. Another conjugate pair is energy and time. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But let's go back to this idea that if we want to determine the location and momentum of an electron, we've got to see it. And the way to see it is to shine a photon off it. Now, photons have momentum. De Broglie wavelength was given by h over p so that particles with momentum have a wavelength. Reversing that, particles with a wavelength will also have a momentum. And this would be the momentum of a photon, h over lambda. So if we come in and we hit that electron with this much momentum, we can change its momentum by up to this amount. That means our delta p, our uncertainty in momentum, will be given by this h over lambda, the momentum of the photon coming in. The way that we localize the position of the electron is to say it's got to be between two wave crests. That is, our delta x is going to be equal to this wavelength here. That's the best that we can do, the best that we can localize a particle with a wavelength lambda. And that means our delta x is going to be given by lambda itself. Now if I multiply those two together, delta p and delta x, what I'm going to get is going to be h over lambda times lambda. In other words, the lambdas will cancel out and I just get this expression, delta p times delta x equal to h. Now this has just been kind of an ad hoc calculation. If you do a more ma mathematical version of this, then what you actually get here is h divided by 4 pi. So that the uncertainty in the momentum times the uncertainty in the position, at the very best, if you've got the very best equipment ever, then the best that you can do, that product has to be bigger than h over 4 pi. So that the larger the delta p is, the smaller the delta x is, and vice versa. The better you know the momentum, the less you know about the location. The more you know about the location, the less you know about the momentum. Very similar with the energy and the time. So once again, if we send in a photon so that we can see our electron, 
It also has an energy. We know the energy of a photon is given by hc over lambda. And therefore, our photon coming in can change our energy by as much as hc divided by lambda. Now, in terms of the amount of time that we're talking about, we've got to remember these waves. They're electromagnetic waves. This is really from a photon. So it's traveling at the speed of light. So our delta t would be how, how much time it takes for this wave to travel one wavelength. So delta t would just be the distance divided by the speed, which in this case would be lambda over the speed of light. So once again, if I take delta e and multiply it by delta t, what I'm going to get is hc over lambda times lambda over c. Of course, the lambdas cancel out and the c's cancel out and we get h again. So that means that the very best that we're going to be able to do is when the product of delta e and delta t equal to h divided by 4 pi. And once again, the 4 pi comes out with proper mathematics. This is really just a approximation here. We're using a bit of a hand-waving ar argument and we're getting an approximation. And this is the equation that the IB data booklet will give you. This is in your IB data booklet, both of these equations for the two conjugate pairs. The product of those experimental uncertainties is always going to be greater than or equal to h divided by 4 pi. Now let's see how we can apply this by tackling a few IB questions. So what I'd like you to do is read over the question, pick out the best answer, and then come back to check your reasoning. Okay, so in this question here, the magnitude of the uncertainty in the position of a particle, so that means that delta x is going to equal to the de Broglie wavelength, which would be lambda, and our equation for the de Broglie wavelength is h divided by p. Uh, which of the following is the minimum uncertainty in the momentum delta p of the particle? Well, that would mean that delta p times delta x, that conjugate pair, is supposed to be, in the very best case, equal to h over 4 pi. Now, we said that delta x is now h divided by p, delta p times h over p is equal to h over 4 pi. So we can do a little bit of cancellation here. And delta p is going to equal p divided by 4 pi. And that would be answer A. Second question, once again, I'd like you to pause the video, try it out, and then come back for the answer. Okay, so in this question, we've got a proton confined to a nucleus. And we know the size of a nucleus is about 10 to the minus 15 meters. We have located that proton to within this size, 10 to the minus 15. That is to say, delta x, our uncertainty in the location, is about 10 to the minus 15 meters. And now, using the uncertainty principle, I can say that delta x times delta p uh, must be greater than or equal to h over 4 pi. And h is uh, 6 times 10 to the minus 34. And you've got to divide by 4 times pi. And this is approximately 10 to the minus 35. So what we've got now is that delta x, which we said was 10 to the minus 15, times delta p has to be greater than or equal to this value here. The very smallest uncertainty that we can have in the momentum would be when delta p is equal to 10 to the minus 35 divided by 10 to the minus 15 which is 10 to the minus 20. So what this means physically is that here's our proton inside the nucleus. It 
which sometimes be moving to the right, sometimes moving to the left, sometimes it's got a negative momentum, sometimes it's got a positive momentum, sometimes it's got zero momentum. But we could say, on the whole, its momentum should range somewhere between negative 10, meaning negative meaning to the left, uh, raised to the minus 20 newton seconds, all the way to positive 10 to the plus 20 newton seconds. So that's kind of the range of momenta that we would be expecting that proton inside the nucleus to have. And so B is the correct answer. There's a few very important consequences of the uncertainty principle. Uh, one of them relates to virtual particles. It turns out the, the electromagnetic force is caused by an exchange of what are called virtual photons. Photons that uh, exist for very brief periods of time. And they're sort of allowed to exist because if you take the energy of the photon and multiply it by the amount of time it exists for, and the amount of time it exists for will be very, very small, that value is going gonna, is gonna to be less than h over 4 pi. So in a sense, these virtual particles, they can kind of appear out of nothing because they don't violate the uncertainty principle. Now, the photons, they're, they have a fairly small delta E, so they've got a kind of tiny delta E, and these virtual photons can exist for a relatively large amount of time. That means they can travel a fair distance. The strong nuclear force is caused by a different type of uh, particle, another virtual particle called a gluon. It's an exchange particle, and it's got a much larger energy. A gluon has a lot more energy than a photon. And what that means is that the amount of time that a gluon can last for is much, much smaller. And of course, because it lasts much smaller, the strong nuclear force is going to be a much shorter range force because the gluons can't travel as far before they disappear again. So in a sense, we're violating the law of conservation of energy at least at a first look, because we've got all these virtual particles that are appearing out of nothing. But they're allowed to because they don't violate the uncertainty principle. If we take a deeper look at it, then we kind of have to consider the fact that what we call a vacuum really isn't a vacuum at all. There's constant ripples in space that are taking place. And these, these ripples are, are these virtual photons and virtual gluons. That, so there's just an inherent energy to space itself. And so overall, we'd have to say that energy is conserved. We just have to consider the fact that a vacuum really isn't zero energy. Now, we've kind of talked about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle being an experimental limitation. It actually goes quite a bit deeper than that. It's really an absolute limitation. And we can see that if we look at these wave functions again. Mathematically, we're just going to look at them as waves. So let's say that we know the wavelength, and therefore the momentum, to within a small range. And so this, this might be our smallest wavelength within the range, and this would be our largest wavelength within the range. And we have a range of wavelengths here. Now, if we use superposition and we just add up all of those waves, what we get looks like this. So we can start to see some localization here. That's just kind of a still picture, but if we in fact move our waves forward at the speed of light, we would have moving particles. This would be like a moving particle caused by the superposition of many waves. Now, when we know more about the wavelength, that is when our delta lambda is small, and we do our superposition, then we get a packet that's relatively spread out. We get a fairly large delta x. If we know less about the wavelength, that means our delta lambda is larger, then our packet is much narrower. We get a smaller delta x. Now, of course, when we know more about the wavelength, 
we also know more about the momentum because those two are related because of the de Broglie wavelength lambda is equal to h over p so when we know more about lambda we know more about p as well so in this case here we know a lot about lambda we've got it that narrowed down quite well but then we get it we don't know much about the location our particle is kind of more spread out if we don't know so much about the wavelength and we've got a big spread in wavelengths then we actually get a much more refined particle a much well more localized particle those are waves they can be treated mathematically and precisely and we do when we do that mathematically and precisely then we do get this relationship that delta x times delta p uh, is has got to be greater than or equal to h over 4 pi and that's where that value of 4 pi comes into play properly here's an ib question what i'd like you to do is to pause the video read the question over and pick what you think is the best answer okay so we're being asked where do we get the largest uncertainty in the momentum so you get the largest certainty in momentum when you have the smallest localization of the particle and in this one here we've got the most localized particle delta x is the smallest in this case and that means you'll get the largest uncertainty in momentum so the best answer here is C and that's all for today folks thank you very much